an original MCM production. like to call upon fellow member Susan Zilber or excuse me Susan Lloyd executive director of the, it's such a Freudian I do it every time Susan I forgive me from the Zilber Family Foundation she will introduce today's speaker I was gonna goof sooner or later thank you actually it wouldn't be such a bad thing right to be related to Joe Zilber Many of you knew him uh, and can appreciate that comment. Um, I, I do have the pleasure today of introducing Erica Pothig, our speaker. The last time I saw Erica, she was leading a session at the Federal Reserve Conference, biennial conference, on community development research. The first time I saw Erica was, well, let's just say in another lifetime. Um, she was then, uh, she was then, Already on task, she was working with Chicago's civic leadership to create a unifying agenda for that city for the next 100 years. It was the centennial of the Burnham Plan and the Metropolis 2020 project was an attempt to really bring together the government sector, the private sector, and the nonprofits in Chicago around an agenda to which they could align their investment. Um, in the intervening 20 or so years, I don't know, I'll keep it the secret, um, Erica has stayed the course. She has served as Acting Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. While at HUD, she was the leading architect of the White House Council for Strong Cities and Strong Communities. She's worked at the MacArthur Foundation as Associate Director for Housing, um, and then at the Chicago Department of Housing as Assistant Commissioner. There she was the strategist behind Mayor Richard Daley's uh, campaign against foreclosures and predatory lending. Erica holds a master's in public policy from the University of Chicago. She was a Fulbright scholar at the University of Vienna, and she serves as a trustee at her alma mater, which is Wooster College. And she's also on the board of the Center for Community Change as well, Community Progress, and she's also on the board of Mercy Housing. Erica is going to talk to us today about the future of our region, particularly the economic and social future of our region. Please join me in welcoming Erica. Good afternoon. Thank you, Susan, for that um, lovely introduction and to Mary McCormick for the invitation to join you today. Um, I love the mission of Rotary. It is a true pleasure to be a speaker uh, at your luncheon series. Um, it's also a pleasure to be in Milwaukee and Wisconsin. I will be back in a few weeks on my way to the North Woods, the Nicolay Forest, and then Door County for our annual uh, summer vacation. Nothing says summer to me like Wisconsin. Uh, it evokes only positive uh, memories, so much so that my husband and I named our second son Benjamin Oconto. Uh, no joke. <laughs> um, so we have uh, Wisconsin is in, in, my, in my blood. So today I want to talk to you about, based on some work that colleagues and I at the Urban Institute have done, um, on future trends for the Great Lakes region, and I'm going to take that to Wisconsin and Milwaukee as well, um, discuss some forthcoming research looking at the pathways to opportunity for children and youth in the, the Great Lakes region in Milwaukee, and then look at some strategies for building a more inclusive region, which is a challenge I think almost every metropolitan region in the Great Lakes faces. 
This is based on uh, research that, as I mentioned, my colleagues and I did for the Joyce Foundation to inform their philanthropic strategy, which has the Great Lakes as its footprint. Um, it also will draw on research that we uh, did in partnership with the Metropolitan Planning Council in Chicago with support from the MacArthur Foundation and the Chicago Community Trust on the cost of segregation and work by Raj Chetty, who's an economist at Stanford and a Milwaukee native. So before the 2016 election results played out, my colleagues and I had already formed the conclusion that the Great Lakes region needed a fresh narrative about its economic future. But this last election cycle revealed more widespread uncertainty in places like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio about the set of strategies and policies uh, aimed at promoting greater economic mobility than we had certainly realized, um, especially for white working class Americans. But given the current discourse, it is sometimes hard to remember that before the election, our nation was also beginning to seriously grapple with and have more honest conversations about structural racism and the way black and brown people have been treated not only by police but in larger society. Both aspects of this national discontent are playing out in the Great Lakes region and the rest of the country is paying close attention. And at Urban Institute, we are trying to elevate the debate with facts and evidence. So in this search for a story, we look for the, at the region's strengths, of course. And this is the Great Lakes region that we use as a footprint for our research. Um, others would, might include uh, Western New York and, and Pennsylvania, too. Um, and some of the same challenges also apply. And some of the same strengths apply. And despite the economic struggles, there's room for a lot of optimism about the Great Lakes because of the strong manufacturing base, the growing educational attainment of young people, and the continued entry of young people into the workforce. And Wisconsin um, fares comparatively well in the region in terms of social and ec economic indicators. It lost fewer jobs between 2000 and 2010, but it has also been slower to recover as well. I don't need to tell anyone in this room that perhaps one of the region's greatest assets is, of course, the Great Lakes themselves. 90% of the U.S.'s fresh water source and Milwaukee's legacy, along with Chicago's legacy and Detroit's legacy and Cleveland's legacy, are all tied to the natural resource that is our Great Lakes. But today, I want to argue that Milwaukee and this region, this larger region, also have another important natural asset that are fundamental to its prosperity. And it is the children and the youth of this region. So in this work that we did um, for the Joyce Foundation, we used our demographic models to project out into the future um, based on certainly the past as prologue, um, just to see if the past stayed the same, what, what should we expect? Um, and this is also born out of the philosophy that you can also change. <laughs> you can change if you make certain decisions. But this is if nothing else changes, between 2010 and 2040, the Great Lakes region will add 600,000 children each year. 600,000 babies born. And yet, notwithstanding this quite remarkable number, um, the Great Lakes population, while growing, is also declining as a share of the U.S. population. And why does that matter? Well, it matters for a great deal, not the least of which is resource allocation, uh, political representation, to name a few of the reasons why that population, even if you have population growth, the population share declining matters. Now, this steady stream of births um, eclipses the migration as a source of population stability. Why is that important? Because I think this region often set, thinks, well, people will need water someday, and they'll come back to the Great Lakes, which may absolutely be true, um, but that may still be a pathway that is still in the future. Um, there may be other reasons why we might capture migration, but internal migration has slowed to historic lows. International migration is also slowing and may slow further. So it means that the children being born in this region are absolutely essential to the long-term future economic prosperity. 
Now, Milwaukee County has one of the highest birth rates relative to the state, but at the same time, um, it is also losing population to uh, domestic migration. So if we look again out to the future, we know that this region, the larger Great Lakes region, um, will diversify but still remain majority white. It will be whiter than the rest of the United States. But the people that it will add are largely people of color. Um, the yellow uh, are Hispanics who will be growing at the fastest rates and African Americans will be growing at a slightly smaller rate and then other is really a category that is inclusive of people who are either Asian American or who also might claim a variety of um, racial and ethnic identities. What is true for Wisconsin is also true for the rest of the region, that is the region is growing older. Um, but Milwaukee, and it was said, is an economic engine for the state because one of the things it's contributing are the children and youth who join the workforce. Um, and this uh, graph, based on our demographic models, is showing you the composition of the population change over the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, and so you see in the 2020s, the big red uh, block are the baby boomers who are aging and will really comprise a large part of the workforce. The positive sign is that births are starting to happen again in the region, and this is Milwaukee region, um, whereas in the, this decade, um, the declines in children and youth were quite precipitous. So there's hope going forward, um, and that growth is going to come largely from um, people of color. And whites will be declining as a portion of the population. So we need to think about our future in ways that are more uh, inclusive and diverse, um, and, and that, is a lar that is linked to the prosperity of this region. This is a map from Raj Chetty's uh, and very important research that got a lot of attention in the New York Times, so you may have seen it. Um, and this is a map about the geography of upward mobility in America. So this is a chance of a child reaching the top 20% of the income distribution if they, are, if, they are grown, if they are born in a poor family. And we see this geography of opportunity. We see the South has considerable challenges, but that dark spot you will recognize also as Milwaukee um, facing considerable challenges in providing that kind of mobility for its young people. I put them in Milwaukee in context uh, with the, some of the other cities and counties uh, in the Great Lakes. You'll see as a comparison, Seattle and King County is at the, near the top. Um, but Cleveland, Milwaukee, Wayne, Cook County, where Chicago is, all face very similar challenges uh, in providing that kind of mobility to the young people of this region. And this is Raj Chetty, as I mentioned. He was raised in Milwaukee, and this is um, a quote that he offered on this. And uh, in, in actually, it was a Milwaukee Journal Sentinel article. You may have seen it. The bottom line for Milwaukee is that unfortunately at the moment it is not a very high opportunity place for those with low incomes. Places with higher levels of segregation like Milwaukee uniformly have lower rates of upward mobility. So my intent is not to leave you there, but to look forward and imagine what are the strategies that do work to create opportunity from cradle to career for our young people? What more, or what are you doing well? What are we doing well? And what could we be doing better? So one of the ways in which Wisconsin uh, is, uh, stands out among its, West, uh, its Great Lakes peers is the investment that the state has made in pre-K, especially for four-year-olds. And you can see this uh, here where Wisconsin is well exceeding other states in the Great Lakes in terms of the proportion of kids, uh, four-year-olds, who are attending uh, pre-K. Um, at a reasonable investment uh, as well. So bravo, uh, well done. That is one of the most critical investments you can make to achieve economic mobility and long-term success. And the state also performs well on uh, NAEP scores, uh, key education metrics, but the achievement gap persists. And this is particularly true for the achievement gap between um, African-American students and white students. You know as well as I do that 70% of African Americans live 
in uh, Milwaukee region. So this is an indicator of the ways in which those young people are performing in the um, schools here in this region. Another critical way I mentioned earlier that what we're seeing is that actually uh, um, educational attainment is increasing in the region. Um, and this is also drawing from Raj Chetty's work on economic mobility. One of the things he did was using IRS data looked at the extent to which um, kids who started college in the lower uh, quintile rate got to the highest quintile in about 10 years. And this is the set of Big Ten um, universities. And I know that um, the Wisconsin system has been um, doing a great job on completion, but you see here there is room to grow uh, in promoting the mobility of the young people who attend uh, the full U University of Wisconsin system. So this is all system data. This wasn't disaggregated um, by universities. Wisconsin also has low unemployment. Uh, which is a very good thing. It uh, is, of course, uh, uh, um, slightly higher here in the county and Milwaukee City, um, and African Americans face higher unemployment than whites. So there, too, is a, a racial gap that needs to be closed. Um, one of the strategies that many regions are adopting to address these gaps are apprenticeships. And, um, Wisconsin, notwithstanding its long tradition of trades, had a lower active apprenticeship rate uh, than other Great Lakes states, but we took another look and it has the highest number of new programs. So this is clearly a strategy that is beginning to be adopted in this region that I think ha could have payoff. So where are the jobs coming from uh, that people uh, are training for or that are an attraction for the young people in this region? The location quotient essentially means that there are disproportionately higher shares of these occupations in Milwaukee region than in the US total. So you see that personal care and service occupations have been growing over this last period. The problem is as a national trend, the wages for those jobs are um, very level. And so they aren't necessarily growth um, opportunities, but with an aging population, the expectation I would have is that they will continue to grow, grow as a share of the jobs in this region, especially for the care that um, older baby boomers will be requiring uh, as we age. Um, but also to be taken away from this is that manufacturing is still a critical component of the overall um, job base. So I want to move from a discussion about the policies and the programs that can make a difference uh, in promoting economic mobility. These are largely investments in human capital, um, but they're not everything we need to do. What we know uh, have for a long time from the bodies of research, but which Raj Chetty put into sharp relief with his work, um, is that place matters for economic mobility. It matters significantly. It, when a child lives in a neighborhood of lower than 10% poverty, they can see a 30% growth in their income over time. That is a big deal. So place matters for mobility, but segregation is a fundamental challenge in the Great Lakes region faced by almost every city. And we did work, as I mentioned earlier, with the Metropolitan Planning Council on um, Chicago's challenges related to segregation because the community there was tired of talking about it and, and people saying, well, it costs too much to do something about it. It's too intractable to do something about it. But the status quo is also costing us. So we partnered with them on a research project to understand the costs of economic and racial segregation. As a part of that, we looked at data for all 100 um, largest, what we call commuting zones or regions. And it may not be a surprise to you, but the region that um, has the highest levels of segregation between blacks and whites is Milwaukee. What may be a surprise to you is that um, the region has been losing ground on the segregation between Latinos and whites. Um, this is a, a this surprised us quite a bit, but and and it's been shifted quite precipitously in the last ten years uh, toward more um, segregate more patterns of segregation. But 
the thing I want to um, talk about is this um, finding that Milwaukee, notwithstanding the racial segregation patterns, that there um, that this region is only 35th in the highest in terms of economic segregation. And that is, I think, to many who study these issues, uh, a bit of a surprising statistic. In his book, Stuck in Place, Pat Sharkey tries to understand the role that place matters in uh, economic mobility. And he's particularly interested in the patterns of affluent African Americans who live in neighborhoods of higher concentrations of poverty. In the US, 37% of black families earning $100,000 or more live in poor areas. Only 9% of white people do. In Milwaukee region, 59% of black families earning $100,000 or more live in poor areas, and only 6% of whites do. And this um, dynamic was brought home to me in an article uh, you all probably saw a year ago in the New York Times that tried to get, um, understand this in a very thoughtful way using the Milwaukee region as a lens. And it followed a number of African American families who had moved in, who were living in higher opportunity neighborhoods or white neighborhoods or white suburbs, but moved back to North Milwaukee because they didn't feel welcome, because it was too stressful, because they just wanted to feel at home. And that is the legacy, certainly, of structural racism, of the patterns of housing discrimination that were made many years ago, but they still operate in our society today. And this quote from one of the people interviewed said, it just felt like where we should be. And I would offer that that is a completely understandable um, feeling and notion, but it has costs when we um, don't really truly address our patterns of segregation. And this is the set of estimates that we came up with from the work in Chicago. What does segregation cost Chicago? It costs income, lives, and potential. Addressing segregation would add $4.4 billion in additional income to the economy. It would boost the region's GDP by $8 billion. It would reduce the homicide rate by 30%. And get this one, it would mean adding 83,000 more bachelor's degrees for both blacks and whites. So it matters to all of us. Now, I did a little bit of the estimations for Milwaukee for the presentation, thinking about a drop of 20% in economic and racial segregation uh, would mean an increase in the per capita uh, income for blacks by 2000 just over $2,000. And by bringing that down 40% would nearly double that. So it matters. So what will it take? This is hard work. Um, the folks in Chicago are this summer um, developing neighborhood typologies and interviewing people and gathering some qualitative ideas about the politics of making shifts. We are helping them uh, measure using our models to answer like what if you instituted this policy, what change would it make? It's important work. But I want to offer and leave you with some other ideas today that we have in our um, principal report on what it will take for this larger region, the state of Wisconsin and Milwaukee, to get that kind of prosperity that I think we all seek. It will take investments in children and youth, especially children and youth of color. One of the most fundamental important things that we can do together as a society is invest in the safety net protections, especially at this period of time of economic uncertainty. Wisconsin, as you well know, is the only state in the Great Lakes region that didn't expand Medicaid as a part of the Affordable Care Act expansion. Why does this matter? Well, 50% of births are covered by Medicaid. So it becomes an important part of the safety net to support family development. 
Um, I have this fantasy, too, that the Great Lakes states would um, develop a, a, an affirmative strategy on paid family leave to send the signal to the rest of the na nation, the coast, that um, this is a very family-friendly region um, and that sending a signal like that would, I think, be a huge for even doing that kind of attraction as much as it would be helping families in this region. It will also be critically important to close the achievement gaps um, that I mentioned before. So integrating new immigrants may not seem uh, at the top of the list for this particular region, but the Latino population has been growing considerably in the last 10 years. I think it's really important, uh, and the places that we've seen that have done this well have sent affirmative signals to immigrants that you're welcome here through language access programs, not only in the schools like ESL, but in the public libraries and the other public institutions. Those kind of affirmative signals um, are extremely important. Festivals celebrating the heritage of not only the Germans who built this town, uh, but the new folks who have also uh, recently come is also uh, incredibly important. As well as creating the kind of investment um, strategies that promote small business investments in the neighborhoods uh, where immigrants are moving to and living. Another really critically important set of strategies that um, I'm excited by the work of Milwaukee United and the ways that that's aligning public, private, philanthropic investment in neighborhood revitalization. So at the same time we're investing in downtown, we're also leveraging that for investment in the neighborhoods because that sends an important signal. It's not just about whites integrating into African-American neighborhoods or supporting mobility to white neighborhoods. It's also about showing that neighborhoods where people are living today matter and count. Uh, and those kinds of efforts are hugely important strategies. And finally, I would leave with and end with that Regional cooperation to create more access to opportunity for people of color through workforce system coordination. I know you're doing some work here on uh, racial equity and job access. This is critically important work um, to connect employers to address the uh, barriers to inclusion. And then also the work in higher opportunity neighborhoods and suburbs to make these more inclusive places for people of color. That can mean training for police on implicit bias. That can mean other affirmative actions that even neighbors take uh, to promote greater inclusion. I want to finally end with this piece, which is on the Marsha Coggs Health and Human Services building that I drive by on 43 on my way north, and I take special pleasure in looking at it, and you may be asking why. Well, 10 years ago, my sister Johanna Pothig, who's a public artist, was commissioned to do this installation on this building, and she went out into the community and she asked, what does community mean to you? How, how do you know you're included in this community? And she got back incredible words and sentiments that are part of the uh, mosaic installation on this building, and the one that stuck with me was catalyst. And thinking about this moment and this important inflection point that we're at as a catalyst for change. Our future is not determined. We can shape our future. We can make decisions. We can take actions um, that confront certainly the structures that ha were laid in place um, many decades ago. But we can also undo those uh, for the purposes of creating greater prosperity for the people living in this region today. And I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you. Yes, questions? Yeah, so, do you, so the, um, I'm sorry, your name is? Your name, yeah. Scott asked a question about, um, the uh, apparently sizable number of organizations working on poverty in this region, and I'm certainly no expert to know um, um, about the pure nature of that. I can speak more generally to it. And then why are kids promoted to the next grade if they can't read? Um, which is a very serious issue. It's one of the reasons why measures of accountability that hold our schools accountable are important uh, measures to include. I can't speak to specifically um, how that's playing out in the Milwaukee region, but um, 
it is critically important for closing the achievement gap that we are resourcing our schools well enough, can taking into account that the resources are flowing to the schools where we need to help um, that are under-resourced and where we need to help supplement with greater resources in order to address that achievement gap, which you mentioned, and hold schools accountable. It's a two-way street, I think, um, for sure. Um, in relationship to the set of organizations addressing poverty, um, I would just add that every place that I've worked has a different approach and um, to addressing poverty. Some, uh, like in Houston, have one large agency that um, serves everybody and it's, it operates on that kind of scale. It achieves great outcomes, but I've also seen um, places that value work that's closer to the ground and that it attends to people uh, and has a community engagement component that have also been truly successful. Um, I imagine that Milwaukee is a place that values that community connection. Um, so I can only hypothesize that one of the things that is reflected in that is that some of the strategies to address poverty are very much tied to place. Uh, and revitalization that I mentioned before, and that those kinds of strategies can be achieved by having the kind of community-based organizations that um, can support that revitalization effort. Thank you for the question. Yes. So I think one of the, one reflection I have on the, uh, sorry, the question was on public transit and the role it plays in uh, integration efforts. And I think there are two ways to think about that. One is the, is it a metropolitan system? Is it a system that connects people in the city to the suburbs? Uh, and then also, of course, brings uh, suburban commuters into the city in meaningful ways. So there's just, what does the system map look like? And um, how much is it connecting community, I think, is real, a really important reflection. And um, certainly, um, in Minneapolis, where they've done a service expansion, one of the things they did very thoughtfully was also think about how that service expansion could add to and promote greater um, economic development for the communities around it and promote inclusion. So when you're adding uh, new uh, infrastructure, I think it's also important to be thinking about what benefit does it play to the larger community. A third and often overlooked aspect of inclusion is the biases that we base into, that, that get mapped into the routes, especially bus routes. Uh, and I have done some work in places like Fresno, California and Youngstown, Ohio, and you look at the service routes and they don't connect to jobs and they don't connect to education. They may connect to services, but they don't connect to opportunity. And so sometimes we have to challenge the biases in our routing to understand what connections are we providing people that are supportive of greater inclusion. And I think those are sometimes the kind of overlooked set of uh, connections um, that are worth taking a look at. Yes, and then we'll go back here. So up, yeah, the mobility. 50% of school mobility is residential mobility. And I don't know about you, but I was profoundly affected by Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted, which focuses on uh, North Milwaukee and those patterns of what I'm certain is showing up in the school system are those patterns of eviction creating greater housing stability, um, creating more affordable housing, addressing some of those issues, I would hypothesize would also address some of the school mobility that we see. Um, and so that would be a solution that I would point to as helping to address the school mobility as well. Um, so th thank you for that question and observation. Yes. Thank you for this question. So the, the observation was a Chicago Fed study that showed the biggest ROI on an investment, a dollar investment, is an investment in early childhood education. Um, Urban Institute partnered with Bridgespan, which is a philanthropic consulting organization, looking at um, uh, if, a, if a donor were to invest a billion dollars, what would the ROI be on social mobility? And they came up with six bets. Um, one of them was on early education. And by for sure, it definitely returns, uh, a, um, uh, it was among the six bets that we designed, returned a benefit um, for income. 
But so too does this uh, connection between place and economic mobility. A 30% return on living in a lower poverty neighborhood is quite a considerable return as well. So I wouldn't say it, um, I would say in comparison to an array, a smaller subset, it does quite well and maybe in some cases it may exceed, but there are a set of other things related to uh, reducing mass incarceration, um, family planning, other strategies that also have a, a positive effect on economic mobility. But um, that can be found on our website um, uh, under Big Bets for Social Mobility, Urban Institute. You can Google. Thank you. Over here. Sure, sure, thank you. Thanks for uh, indulging me because this is truly a fantasy because I, I think one of the most important things is to send strong signals and the kinds of signals that get picked up in the press um, that uh, we're a regional cooperation around a paid family leave policy that might be something that the businesses in the region or even the anchor institutions in the region and other large employers would cooperate on providing which I, and signal to people that this region values families. And one of the region, we, ways we do that is through family leave. So that would be a private sector strategy to promote family leave that could be one done in cooperation with a few large institutions that I think would have a powerful signaling effect um, and a reputational effect, a positive reputational effect for the region. There are other strategies related to you know, state policy or city policy that could be tied to that as well um, as other kinds of employers. But I'm thinking of it principally as an employer strategy aimed at providing a strong signal to people on the West Coast, uh, to people on the East Coast, to people in other regions that for whom this is a concern, that might bring them home, that might keep them here. I, I think it is worth looking at as a, as a strategy. Hopefully that answers your question. Julie. Thank you. So this is a question about the issue related to trauma and that being a fundamental challenge. And the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, um, Susan, I think, sent me the link to the five-part series on trauma that was really powerful. Um, and I think I w would absolutely agree with you. I think there are some interesting new interventions. There's a head start trauma-informed approach, for instance. I mean, just trying to address the trauma as early as possible while we're also trying to deal with the violence that exists in the households and on the streets. I mean, domestic violence um, is one of the most sort of critical um, issues. And I think there are some interesting strategies related to domestic violence, both through the justice system and then through housing that are worth taking a look at because of the interrelationship that I think those circumstances play in kids' lives, not just the, the violence on the street, but the violence in the home um, as an aspect of it. And they might, it might feel also more tangible um, to work on potentially um, is another sort of pathway to addressing the trauma. But I think that what I appreciate about that article is it connected it then to workforce and labor force attainment and the path, those pathways and needing to think about the mental health and behavioral supports necessary. I would just add that one of the things the social safety net provides and Medicaid provides is a set of supports for behavioral um, uh, kinds of uh, resources for which could be applied to trauma and the kind of community health workers rely upon that um, for that work too. Um, there was a question back here. So interestingly, um, I have not looked at that from the political science lens. What I have looked at is uh, work on building regional resilience. Um, so looking at metropolitan regions and what has made them successful. And what you're naming, I would also call is some uh, regions have different governance leadership classes or ways in which problems are governed. And I oftentimes think about cities as almost being nonpartisan, often today in particular. Um, and where party means less, it's more practical and oriented toward problem solving. And that's why people like working it for the local government, because you can sometimes set some of the partisanship aside and you can just focus on problem solving. Um, I think it's an interesting reflection. I think uh, Chicago, for instance, um, has just the Tribune just did a big expose on property taxes and the ways in which African American neighborhoods were mistreated by the property tax system as compared to white working class, middle class neighborhoods. Chicago has been controlled by Democrats for decades and part of this was 
um, party politics playing into the property tax uh, assessment system. So, I mean, that would go to your theory um, that we need challenge, we need an accountability system that sets that enables us to ask these questions and challenges. That the press is playing an important role, but so too can an independent um, auditor inside government be another mechanism by which to hold our public sector accountable. And but Indianapolis is an example of a. Uh, Midwest city that is doing relatively better than some of its peers, I would note. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Really honored to be here. production.